Well, Mark, here's your November monthly update and you've become a trio. Yeah, I just thought it was interesting to get, you know, a view from the manager on here and obviously our vice captain just from their perspective because it... A lot of the, the questions these days seem to relate to what's going on on the pitch. So, you know, get them straight from the horse's mouth. Didn't offer them a cup of tea, though. I didn't. No, I did. They just didn't want one. OK. Yeah. <laughs> let's get on. It's a packed programme. Right. Let's start with the Milton End network rail situation. And let me throw three questions into one here. Um, when are the imminent details of the Milton End being released? Why is network, network rail expected to completely foot the bill if PFC want to do work on the stadium, especially with billionaire owners? Why would a third party invest in infrastructure to support an increased number of Pompey fans when the club has yet to release any plans for actually increasing capacity at Fratton Park? Can you clarify there will be no redevelopment of the Milton End unless there is improved access from Fratton Station paid by others? Well, as you say, there's a lot of questions all rolled into one there. So I think it's worth taking a little bit of time and just go from the start from when Michael, you know, took over the club and with our current board and, and what's happened since then to, to arriving at the point where the news did the article this week specifically about the Milton End. So two, two and a half years ago, um, Michael took over the club, um, promised, you know, that money was going to be put into the infrastructure of Fratton Park. Um, obviously, for the first six months to a year, there was a lot of consultation going on with the Heritage and Advisory Board and Tony Goodall Fans Conference and various supporter club meetings about did we stay at Fratton, which was Michael and, and the majority of the board's choice to do so, or do we look elsewhere? So looking elsewhere in the city, there's not a lot really out there, to be honest with you. And, uh, and Michael's preferred preference all the way along. Part of the reason he bought the club was because of the historical nature, aligned with all the majority of fans at the time as well, to stay at our current home at Fratton Park. As I said during the takeover, there was five million pounds worth needed over the next five years um, in regards of emergency health and safety work. A figure approaching that has already been spent, you know, on the basic infrastructure that exists there to keep to keep it going. So where I thought that was going to be spent over five years, it's already been pretty much spent over two and a half, you know, in round figures. Now, aligned with that, we've been doing a lot of more general work um, in regards of, because it's not just about building a new stadium or building a new North Stand or building a new Milton End. It's, it's a more holistic view to the whole area because you can't fund what the cost will be that's what's required at Fratton Park to make the stadium we all want to be proud of just by being, um, just by using it 23 or to 28 times a year, cup competitions, etc. Yeah, it's just, just impossible to make it work. And it's impossible to make it work if you want to increase the attendance over a period of time with the current infrastructure. So you come back to Fratton Park, the rail network generally, and the um, more general transport network, park and ride, you know, the, the motorways into the city, just can it, what can it cope with feasibly? So that's been a, a, a long process. We've, we've been working with the council. We have been working with Network Rail, had meetings with them. Um, as I say, we've been working as well with the Heritage and Advisory Board. Now you come to a conclusion, however you dress it up, it's not just gonna be a stadium development. It's gonna be a wider development to achieve what all fans want in regards of a vibrant, healthy Fratton Park Stadium which includes obviously the walkway in, which has to be safe, um, has to be pleasant to a degree. You know, you want, it, you want a great match day experience, which is, is what, where we all want to go. Now, the first part of that project is the Milton End, which we are, I use the word imminently, I'm hoping in the next week or two, and this is why I don't look to put timescales on, and I always put a caveat on timescales because they're outside of our control, where we, we are desperate to get the plans, um, the architect's plans, align with drawings out to our fan base for consultation before we go into final planning. Now we've actually gone to the council for pre-planning. Planning. They've seen the designs, they've seen what we want to do. We've had some feedback from them. We're now back to the drawing board slightly to make some tweaks and adjustments. And before we go back again, we now want to start involving the fans in that process. Where does Fratton Park Station come into it? It's not just about the Milton end. And bear in mind, this isn't our station. This is a station we are gonna try and do something very special in the Fratton area, not just the stadium. So what we're trying to do 
is work with a lot of key stakeholders in the city, all the big institutions. We are working together because the problem isn't just unique to Fratton Park. It applies the same at Gunwolf, it applies for the university. Everyone's experiencing the same issues. So bef what we've said is, before we now move on, we are gonna, we're gonna show the fans and we're gonna work with them as, as we always do in regards to the Heritage Advisory Board and you know, the spin-offs, the PST, the Tony Goodall Fans Conference, all the ones you know, at that level as well. But ultimately, we've got a decision to make now. Do we commit to Fratton Park knowing that there's no commitment at the moment from anyone any, anyone else in, in regards to network row or in regards of you know, the road network and the local council to assist us to making it the area we want it to be. The, the plans and financially it doesn't work unless we get those commitments. So we're at the stage now where we're gonna release the Milton End. I can't release what we wanna do more generally at the moment because it's commercially sensitive and you know, it, it, it's, it's beyond way beyond the stadium to, to what our ultimate goal wants to be. Yeah, and, it, and that's very commercially sensitive. But the Milton End in isolation, yes, we as a club now are ready to go on that. But before we start in putting into that, the close, in the, in the ballpark figures of single figure millions, but edging towards double digit millions, the second we do that, we lose all of our leverage. So. I've seen the reports about asking Network Rail to pay for it or the council to pay for it. We're not saying, or the club to pay for it. We're just saying we have to work in partnership on this project, otherwise it just doesn't work. And then you're back to if that doesn't work, and before we put a shovel in the ground to address the Milton end in isolation, that then opens up the prospect of us going back to the drawing board, unfortunately, and looking at potentially a move away from Fratton Park. Because if we can't get the fans want the attendance, they want the capacity exactly the same as we do. But if people are telling you, you're not gonna to get to that unless you do X, Y, and Z outside of Fratton Park, what's the point of starting the work? So that's where we are at the moment. We're as frustrated as every single fan out there. That's all I can say. Okay. Do I answer all of that? That was a good answer, that. <laughs> yeah, it was a good answer. Lee, I, I, I bet you're glad you're just a mere player. Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm here. <laughs> Are you oblivious to all these Yeah, no, no, no. I know how awful it's going on. But I know everything now. <laughs> Kenny, let's talk about football. <laughs> um, Andy Cannon, what does he have to do to get into the team? He's been unlucky. I've generally gone for Ben Close alongside Tom Naylor in midfield. And then so far this season, as the, let's say, the one just behind the striker, been Pittman, been Evans, uh, in recent games, been Marquis. Uh, so looking for, let's say, an attacker in that particular area. Uh, but for, for Andy, anyway, he's pushing, he's pushing hard. He's due a chance, I do agree. And as I said, I've kept pretty consistent in terms of Naylor and Close. But Andy Cannons is, is pushing them. And uh, when he comes in, he'd, he'll do well. And Brandon Housrock, not playing in his correct position at the moment, but doing well anyway. Yes, yeah, he's, he's had... 12 games this, uh, this season so far. Generally, since, since, since Lee's been here, I've, I've picked him in the left-back spot um, when he's been needed. Brandon's deputised very well. And then it's interesting, you know, through necessity, through Ross, Ross's injury in the South End game, you know, playing him in a, in a quite an unfamiliar right-back position, how much of an effect he's had on the team at both South End and then Harrogate, you know, both making goals and then scoring a a, a cracker in the cup game from the right back uh, uh, area and really being a, you know, a good creative force going for us down that side. Just to show you when you're quite a natural fullback, you can play either side. And that usually happens more the other way when you've got you know, two right backs and one of them needs to play left back. That's sort of more my experience, but it's happened the other way around in this instance and worked out well for us. Anyway, uh, um, this season's been a good one for Brandon so far with 12 games. And, and as I said, in recent weeks, you know, big contribution, particularly going forward, and something now he can build on because he's been looking for that breakthrough. Is it a big season for people like Brandon? It is, yeah. Uh, and, he, and he's just turned 23 now. And, you know, he's, he's looking, I think, you know, quite like, like, like a number of the younger lads, Stronger now, stronger than, you know, physically stronger, physically fitter, more powerful, you know, every season. That, that happens and, um, you know, his time is now and he's ready. And uh, I do feel in terms of a big season for him, yes, he, he thinks that himself. Like every player, they want to get into the team, they want to try to contribute, they want to, they want to help Portsmouth do well. And, and, you know, nobody more than, than Brandon, who's been here since he was seven years old. Now, one perhaps for both of you gentlemen, um, regards Dan Smith release 
at the end of last season, emphasised perhaps a need for an under-23s team. Is there a reason other than financial for this decision? Um, I think it's fair to say that we have what we call a technical board meeting, um, which is common amongst a lot of clubs. Uh, You know, myself sits on it, Tony Brown, the chief operations officer, so it's not just football related. There's Mark Kelly sits on it, um, our recruitment team, Kenny, Joe, and that's where the decisions are taken. Um, if there was an under 23 teams, would that would we have kept Dan? Possibly, um, would have possibly, but ultimately it comes down to a football decision, and it's not a one year or two year decision. We have to make a decision as a technical board, um, and ultimately guided by the, the football people and, and their professional opinion on it, where, where do we see a particular player being, not just in year one, year two, with or without an under-23 teams, where do we see them being in five, five six years? Do we, do the, we believe they're going to be where we want them to be, where we hope to be at that point, which is potentially the championship? So that's the decision-making process. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and, and also as well, we, we do um, sign a few... Uh, uh, young players pro quite early. We have a number of under 19s this year that uh, you know we've we've looked for, for for loans as well. So in our own way, we have a you know quite a small group of of let's say under 19s now anyway, and 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 um, young pros between 17 and 19 years old. So it is developing and, and coming on slowly with with each season. Uh, we, we would have to look at infrastructure in terms of changing rooms, pitches. Um, uh, uh, just space overall if we went from two groups to three but we, we have made strides anyway in terms of you know keeping a few uh, players as they get slightly older and making sure in our own way and, and with our own version uh, we can uh, keep encouraging our young players that are coming through uh, as, as much as um, uh, in football generally there's quite a bit a big debate between playing let's say an under 23 league or or under 23 um, uh, uh, fixtures and uh, friendlies as opposed to those players then being available to go out and play in non-league it'll be interesting to see you know whatever p- other people think on that but uh, it's not a bad route for us you know for our younger players to be able to go out and into and into non-league football and and as well as that I just don't think you can just keep every player you know you're working at a first team squad between so any, anywhere between let's say 22 to 25 you know, there'll always be a long-term injury in there, but that's generally a first-team group. And and you know, I do think if you're suddenly extending that into the 30s and the 40s, you do you do need the the, the structure to be able to do that, and it has to be then uh, uh, worth your while. Uh, other than that, you're keeping people that you, you you're really not doing any favours to, and and their best route uh, as lads as well is for them to be able to go on their journey. You know, they're young people and maybe two or three moves moving around a little bit helps them grow up. You know, there's life skills involved as well. So it's not necessarily always the right thing just to keep people just for the sake of it. Although, you know, we do pride ourselves on wanting to get through the likes of Ben Close, Brandon Houndstrup. You know, we've mentioned those guys. Alex Bass has played recently. You know, we've, you know, we've played Jack Watmore, etc. We, we want those young guys to come through. We want it to be a part. But it, it, it's it, it, it's a part of a successful equation for a football club. I think the whole thing. just to be clear on that as well, that without an under twenty three, we do have one of the most productive academy systems in the country. Mm. Like our output in regards of players that go from our academy through to the first team is one of the best in the country. So we must be doing something right to to, to be achieving that. So and and every now and again, we're probably going to get one wrong. But that, that's in football generally. It's very subjective and it's a snapshot of that moment in time. But ultimately, our record is very, very good and stands up against any other club. OK. January fast approaching. Obviously, another transfer window beckons. Who is responsible for identifying the players and what research is done before signing the player? We have two full-time scouts, uh, Roberto uh, and, and, and Phil Boardman are, are, are the two that um, work very hard for us and are responsible for being out there on a daily basis, making sure that um, uh, they watch players, then, then collate the information and you know, bring it back to ultimate, ultimately myself to uh, then target and pass on to the board of directors to potentially and possibly sign. That's the, 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 the process at, um, at the moment. And I think below that it's important. It's, it's not just those two. Those two are full-time scouting 
UK and beyond, but we've also got underneath that a layer of part-time scouts that work for us ad hoc on a match day basis. So there is a, there's a pyramid in the structure um, for the recruitment team. But, but ultimately, in regards of the signings, their job is to make Kenny aware of the players that are available, um, get some background information, but it, bec it becomes a, a football manager's choice on who we ultimately sign. Kenny, players are out of contract at several at the end of the season. When does that start to get sort of approached? And you know, when when do you talk to these players? Because obviously you had the Nathan Thompson situation last season, which went on. Yeah, if, if you're looking at our our recent sort of work up to the transfer window, um, that that um, closed end of August, start of September, there was a lot of talk from the back end of last season. Let's say you know uh, uh, the, from the Sunderland game right up to the close of that window, and and there was a lot of talk about uh, uh, people moving, uh, new contracts, um, uh, people being interested in our players, and you know I do think that it affected everybody, and and. You know, had a detrimental effect on our pre-season, had a detrimental effect on the group. It wasn't anybody's fault. I don't think there was anything that we could necessarily do to avoid it, but it did happen. And, and so coming out of that particular period and going into, let's say, September stroke October, um, it, it was my, my thinking that you know, we needed to really get our head down, uh, everybody to commit to the club, uh, to get some spirit, some team spirit, some togetherness, uh, to work the new lads in as much as we can to embrace them, to make them understand what's needed and for, for them to uh, settle down, grow in confidence and be part of the, 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 the Pompey family. That's what we wanted to, to, to breed. And part of that is then not talking about individuals, not talking about individuals' contracts that really did dominate our summer. As I said, it wasn't anybody's fault, but you know, we've needed a period and we still do need a period of that, uh, of that type of talk. Uh, rather than individuals, and, and um, you know, as I said, you know, it was a it was a, 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 a tough one up until the close of that window. Um, and we're making strides; we're improving, but we have to improve again. And and you know, talk of individuals, uh, uh, the team comes first. Uh, talk of let, let's say contracts that has to be on a back burner at the moment. And Portsmouth and and uh, teamwork and all of us, you know, get paid by Portsmouth Football Club to put them first, and we have to concentrate on that. Just a couple of points on that as well, that when you read in the press a lot of the players that are out of contract, they're not taking into account we've actually got year options on some of them, so we're covered by just activating an extra year. And in regards of the two losses in my time, and I'll include Nathan as one of those, that wasn't through not trying to sign or just saying we're not talking until the end of the season. We were trying to sign those players during the season, but you can't force a player to sell. If a player's playing very, very well and his agent's in his ear, as early as September, October, November, saying he's not putting pen to paper because he wants to see his contract out and then review his options at that point. That's the, the polar opposite of what we're doing at this moment. We're actually saying we, we, we don't want to talk about it at the moment. So we've lost players even when we have been trying to sign them during the year. Lee, I suppose as players, you just keep focused on game by game and don't give it too much thought, or do you? No, I think about it every day. <laughs> no, no, I think, I think as players, it's... It's the industry we're in, really. We, if you're playing well, then it's good. If you ain't playing well, it's not so good. I think you're naturally always going to worry um, when you're, if you're going to get offered a contract. I think that's only natural um, as people's got families. But it, it's the industry we. I think you sort of get used to it. I think you got to have you got to have thicker skin. You have got to believe in yourself. Um, and look, it's, as, as the manager and what Mark just said, we work for Portsmouth Football Club. It's, it's their decision, and that's how that's how the cookie crumbles sometimes. And you just got to get on with it as players and do the best you can. Really. And you spent a lot of years at Bristol Rovers, of course. Yeah, I did. Yeah, and I was I was lucky enough to um, keep getting contracts there. Um, I don't know how. I don't know. Why are you laughing <laughs> for on that? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we took after it. <laughs> no, I was lucky enough, but. It, in some cases, it wasn't discussed till the end of the season. Sometimes I got it early. I think it's um, it's different approaches. That, as much as said, even when you're trying to set, sign players, sometimes you, you lose them anyway. So I don't know if there's a right or wrong way to do it. Um, but as players, you got to accept it whatever way the the club want to do it. And then in, in this case, they don't want to do it until the end of the season. So 
that's how it is and you've got to worry if you want to worry worry if you don't want to worry don't it's probably something people don't appreciate though that a footballer's life is, is, is quite uncertain at times yeah it is and, and people don't see that if it, unless you're in the football industry I don't think you realise how ruthless how ruthless the business is because uh, from both sides yeah from both sides yeah um, but as players if you're on one two year contracts you've got families you've got mortgages that could, that could end at the season. It, for for me, it, it it could end at the end of the season. It could end at the end of the season. It, bye bye. Uh, of course, you're naturally going to think how you're going to support your family. Um, and there's there's players out there who do think worry about it. But that is, just, as I say, that's the industry we're in. There's there's pros and cons to every industry, and there's a lot of pros to being being a professional football footballer. And that's probably one of the cons, really, the the ruthlessness and the, the unreliability. But as I say, there's a lot more pros to it as well. I think, Johnny, as well, that from my experience, I'm sure Kenny as a manager and, and Lee as a player, there's shifts in power during a season. Mm. So you get a player that is playing well and there's, there's interest from everyone else, yeah? And then when you're talking to that player and his agent, he doesn't want to sign. And then you'll find a player that's not playing very well and he's, he's coming to the year of his the last year of his contract, all of a sudden the agent's on the phone and wants to negotiate a new deal. So there are these p little intricate power shifts that, that go on. Now, all we've said at this moment in time, and, and listen, we're pragmatic, it can change, is that, look, we, we know where we want to be at the end of this year. You know, we've not hit the highs that we all hoped we would for this start of, for this period of the season. Let's just get our head down, get to where we want to be, and then we'll start sitting down and negotiating and that can be on an individual basis on a group basis but at this moment in time as a club you know talking to Kenny we just don't feel this is the right time to be sorting out new contracts with players the, the focus has got to be on getting results Kenny you've lost the data analysis guy just recently in, in a sort of busy period for a football club um, have you replaced him and do you feel you've got enough staff behind there doing that job yeah we have replaced him the overlap went you know well really to be fair in terms of you know uh, being able to um, serve out your notice which was Andy Gregg was the last guy and then and then um, uh, the, the, the the new guy Dan Ashby being able to come in and the, the two had probably maybe a three-day overlap where they were both in and then one handed over to the other so you know we, we were pleased with that with the, the way it worked it does show you know what a great club Portsmouth is and how you, you can attract good staff and quality staff, and, and in this case as well, experienced staff. Don't kill it. Mark, let's go back to the stadium. <laughs> can't keep away from it. Yeah. Why can't Pompey speak to Portsmouth City Council and bus companies to provide extra buses and perhaps extend the park and ride? We are doing. We're doing that at the moment. It's actually in hand. I was at a meeting this morning where it was brought up again. We've got a further meeting with a couple of other companies in the next week or two. But yeah, we, we are... As much as we're, we're talking to Network Rao and, and the other you know, people involved in, in driving um, a sustainable um, transport policy to Fratton Park and not just on match days, we're also discussing specifically on a match day, how do we get our fans in safely, securely and in the quickest way possible. Will the club consider naming a stand after John Jenkins? Um, oh, that's the first time that's going to say me then. I thought it was going to be me. Um, yeah, you know, John, absolute legend at the club. You know, just not in, not just because of what he's done in the football environment, but because of his wider service to the city. So that's the first time I've heard that, but it is definitely something we should consider. Why is it we claim the roof has been extended on the front end when we know it hasn't? Don't know who knows it hasn't. <laughs> well, no, the the it's the drip line. So what it is is that the I can put this. So all You've the, sold them a dream there, haven't you? You've sold them a dream. <laughs> the disabled fans at the front were getting wet on a match day. Now, you can go back 10, 20 rows on a certain day with a wind blowing in a certain direction and it raining and you're still going to get wet. But this was on a still calm day where the, it was just dripping down on our disabled fans. That has been addressed. So the, the drip line has been put in which is quite a big job, by the way, because is, you, you're talking about a loading on the roof and there had to be some reinforcement going to support that, yeah, and to stop that happening. But that, that is what has been addressed. Oh, you've answered two questions in one there, because the other one was, why hasn't the disabled supporters been given cover? Well, the, the disabled supporters, at, to, at this moment in time, with the current stadium, that's the only real place, and we've, we've talked this through with the DSA over, over, over all of my time here, yeah, over seven years, you know, that, and, and, pre my time 
That's just been an ongoing issue. Part of what we're trying to do in the Milton end is to give a more um, at the back of the stadium um, access for disabled fans so that they can be undercover. In your experience, Mark, another question, are there a huge amount of supporters losing trust and faith in the club? Well, I, I don't... Um, I go back to social media. If you read social media, yes. However, all I can go back to is the investment that's been ramped up, you know, in regards of the stadium over my time here, which is a six, seven year period. Um, six years that I've been in charge as CEO, we've only regressed once on the pitch, and I'm still hopeful that we will be fourth place last year. Um, we've had a promotion to playoffs. We've, we've won the EFL trophy. You know, it's all been geared steady and sustainable to get back into the championship. We're in no debt. We've got money in the bank. We've got money put aside for the stadium. Um, you know, season ticket sales have continued to rise dur during my time here. I think the first year that they, I forget what they were, but there was circa 10, 11, 12,000 maybe. But over the course of time, they've, they've continued to grow. Commercial revenues continue to grow. So I don't know what, on what basis that those concerns are because we are in a unique position as a football club that you know we've got wealthy backers there to support us if needed however Michael and the ball were elected in on a ticket on a promise of running the club self-sustainably but they would invest in the infrastructure which is what they've done to the tune of many millions since they came in and giving us the tools to to generate more commercial revenue so something that's not been mentioned really and we don't go on about too much is is just even in regards to the player budget so in a sustainable way that has increased gradually year after year both under community ownership and under the last two years under michael's ownership so everything is going in the right direction and but i've always said that's the steady sustainable growth that was promised however some of our fans, and listen, I'm not knocking them, everyone's entitled to, and, to an opinion. That is never going to be fast enough. But all I can tell you is that we are progressing. And that's the facts. That are the facts. Listen, wouldn't we have wanted this in 211, 212? Yeah, but I think we have to revert back. You know, the, the club was in a dark place at that time. I think we've gone beyond that. We've, I've always said we've built really good, solid foundations. You know, we continue to grow on those foundations. And yeah, th listen, every club makes errors along the way. But if you look at the facts, and that's what I always try and stick to, because football's a very emotive industry to be in, whether you're the manager, whether you're a supporter, whether you're the chief exec, a director, Michael, whoever it might be, you know, it's an emotive sport and you want that emotion. However, as the CEO put in my business hat on factually, you, you have to look at the facts. And as I've said, in, in my six years here, um, we've regressed just once in our league position. Um, this year, you can't say because we, the season's not finished. And, I, and as I say, I'm still confident we've finished, we'll finish above fourth. That, is, that has been my aim all the time, this, to, to improve on the season before. So as long as we keep on that up, upward trajectory on the pitch, as long as we keep investing, which we do, in the player budget, which continues to rise, as long as we continue to invest in the transfer budget, which was a record for us in, in going out this year, and we've got money put aside for future years in regards of the player budget as well. And as long as Michael keeps fulfilling his promises, which he has done up to now, in putting substantial millions into addressing the issues with Fratton Park, then as the chief executive, I'll be happy. But again, that might not be at the pace some of our fans expect because, and again, rightly so, they see the championship as our natural home. And we all share that vision. It's just how do we get there? And Michael came in with a clear vision and he's sticking to that strategy. OK, one club didn't survive Berry. What about refunds and why do corporate season ticket holders get the FA Cup game for free with a meal, but normal season tickets, ticket holders don't? Well, in regards of the, there's going to be a, a, um, an announcement on this in the next, next day or two, two, we're hopeful, yeah. So you know as well, Johnny, we've discussed it at the previous yeah. two Tony Goodall fans conferences and we've discussed it at the Heritage and Advisory Board. So they're fully aware of what's going on. In regards of why the corporate hospitality got free so they could swap their berry game for the, for the cup game was because when you, you're doing corporate hospitality, you don't profit share it with the other club. So we would have got in all sorts of trouble by offering free refunds and then, rightly so, Altrincham would have said, hold on, that money's ours. So it would have been a, a big task to unravel that. Corporate hospitality is completely different because that's not part of the share of the gate receipts. Okay, so we was able to do that. But there will be three, four, maybe five different options where pe people 
in regards of the Berry season ticket money can, you know, ranging from a refund right up to free games to donations, credit on next year's season ticket. You know, these are all things that are being finalised at the moment. But we know what we want to do is just putting the structures in place behind that. So when people request what they want out of it, we're ready to act immediately upon that. Many fans disappointed and appalled by the pricing in the club store. £10 for an advert calendar that would cost £1 normally, £20 for a DVD and £40 for a mini football table that would cost £15 anywhere else. What is your response to this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't go into the individual specifics of, of the individual products, but in regards of the club shop, they pay us a, effectively a royalty fee where we share as well in, in the... the um, overall turnover of, of what goes on there. Now, in regards to pricing, they're a self-contained entity that we give them the rights to operate that shop. Now, in regards of um, shirts and things like that, we have a say on the price, and we're very competitive compared to other clubs. You know, at this level, um, more than competitive when you, when you start looking at the Championship and the Premiership pricing. So that's something we know is a core element of what is sold in the club shop. So we want to retain some level of influence on that. When you broaden it out to the profit and loss and how they become sustainable, of which we are no part of that PL, we have to rely on them as the commercial entity in that outlet to make commercial decisions on what they believe they can get for a price, aligned with the quantity and making it pay. So if you go back to a couple of specific items there, I know because, you know, in regards of the our club. DVD. It's done by an ex-president with the help of Colin Farmery and all these different people who put in a huge investment to that product to get it to the point of production. And now they've got to start recouping the money. So it is a supply and demand commercial decision. How many do we have to sell to get this amount of money back to try and recoup some of the investment that we put into it? And that's across all ranges of products. So we don't have a say on that. We can give some recommendations, but they can be dismissed or accepted based on what the cost is per product to produce a Pompey specific project, product, which by the economies of scale, if you're only ordering two, three, four hundred or even a thousand is very expensive compared to something being mass produced where you can get the costs right down and it being Tesco, Sainsbury's or whatever. Okay, Kenny and Lee, is an easy one for you. Was the decision to have grey shirts for away matches made in consultation with yourself and the team? Oh, that's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> Gaffer's fault. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. <laughs> I don't know. No, no, not necessarily. What it, it, it wasn't, to be honest with you. In terms of um, the assessment of, of obviously, you know, wearing the right kit and um, you know, f first and foremost, you know, making sure we adhere to the rules, and and and, and then second, you know. Uh, backing things up commercially, it's, it's done behind the scenes. Lee, does it matter to players what kits they wear? What? No, I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I think it's you're still going to play against 11 men, really. It don't matter too much to the players. Great doesn't affect you psychologically in any way. No, no, why should it? Should it? No, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, I don't, no, it don't, I've never really thought too much in it. I don't think it does to any player, really. Um, might fit a bit different to another one, but on a whole, no, not really. Mark, 10 out of 10 to these lads for perseverance. So put us out of our misery. Mm. Where is Frogmore? Um, Frogmore's alive. Um, you know, he's being fed. He's being looked after. Um, we've got him ready to, to bring him back out very soon. So the lads that keep, you know, threatening they're going to kidnap um, a current mascot, Nelson. Um, you know, you don't need to do that. You know, the, the deal's been done behind the scenes and um, I'm hopeful that by... You know, next year, at the very latest, um, there will be an incarnation of Frogmore back in the public domain. What about the teddy? Probably be a teddy to start off with. But no, we are, to be fair, we are looking more generally at the whole mascot situation. And that's something we're going to start obviously involving the fans in and, and the various junior blues and that. But it's something we are looking at. And uh, yeah, Frogmore is on, on the agenda.